This next video will cover select art and artifacts from early China, Korea, and Japan. So we'll be focusing in on three important cultures in East Asia. So focusing in, starting off with China, on the Yellow River Basin, especially the Banpo settlements. So looking along the Yellow River, right along here, near the modern city of Xi'an, uh, that's where we'll be looking at the cradle of Chinese civilization. Uh, just comparing a topographical map and then one that identifies where Banpo is along the Yellow River. Thinking about pronunciation before we jump into this uh, period of Chinese art, uh, there are a few early dynasties. It's just important to think about how to pronounce them appropriately. So we have the Xia dynasty, the Zhou dynasty, and the Qin dynasty. And we'll be encountering some of these words as we move along, so it's just important to keep the appropriate pronunciation in mind. So, so the Banpo settlements uh, were Neolithic settlements that looked roughly like this. Here are some artistic reconstructions as well as archaeological sites, how they look today. Um, and so you can see how they would have been created with basically poles going into the earth as well as a ditch to surround the settlements, most likely for protection. Uh, and we know that they did create ceramics at these sites because that's what we have discovered. That's what archaeologists have discovered. So we'll look at some of those in just a second. Kilns were kept outside of the ditch and uh, cemeteries were also kept outside of this ditch. You can see that there's a main central structure as well as smaller structures throughout. And we're still trying to figure out how, what kind of uh, worship or religious ritual took place around this time. One possible hint, or at least something that could have been important in the Banpo settlements, uh, is this particular dish or particular bowl where you can see a red fired vessel that has black slip decoration. And I'm just showing you a black and white image as well as a color image right over here. Uh, and you can see just roughly, let's move into the next image, uh, that you can see fish as well as a head. Um, an additional fish off to the side from this man's head. And so there's a couple of questions about this vessel. What does it indicate? So first of all, the importance of fishing um, or this possibly as an important food source for this early Yangshao culture. That's the word here, Yangshao culture. The diameter, the diameter is 15 and a half inches, so relatively uh, large in size. So could have been a significant vessel. Um, so there's one theory that maybe this is an ancestral figure that'll help bring about an abundant catch, maybe some kind of spiritual or ancestral figure. And the ancestry theory is significant because ancestor worship will become very important in China as we continue on uh, looking at this particular culture. Uh, so perhaps this idea was already in place very, very early on. So uh, just thinking about how established Chinese culture was very early in history, this vessel dates to around 5000 to 4000 BCE, so incredibly early uh, just in terms of its dating and even earlier than the Indus Valley culture from the video before. So again, there's just a close-up of that same vessel. You can see it's a nice has a burnished quality to it, quite refined for such an early vessel with some nice geometric patterns as well as those abstracted fish and the head uh, that looks a little different than what we would expect a normal human head to look like. So again, giving this idea that maybe it's a significant ancestor or a spirit, possibly a god of some kind. But the ancestor is one of the theories that people have put forth. All right, let's move on to thinking about jade uh, creation. So this is a song. So this is uh, an oblong jade object with a square exterior and rounded hollow interior. And these sizes vary quite extremely between one inch, so very, very small, up to one foot. So these songs were quite varied just in terms of how large they were. These were buried in elite graves. So those who were uh, very well off, those who had a lot of objects in their tombs. Uh, so these are often called prisms, just the sense that it has that kind of square shape um, with the carved design. Jade is incredibly hard to carve, or this very hard, uh, material and this dates to around 2000 BCE and so the fact that it was so difficult to carve definitely speaks to the fact that it was expensive and that someone who was wealthy would be able to spend the time or have someone spend the time to create this for their tomb or as an, a power object for them. So we think the song probably represent uh, power and also there's the idea of a circular center and a square exterior. And the circle in Chinese culture comes to represent heaven while the square comes to represent earth. So you have this combination of 
earth and heaven coming together. Um, and for someone who is maybe transitioning into the afterlife, this could have a great significance moving from one realm to the other. These songs were often found surrounding the body, um, and then there were discs, B discs, that were sometimes found on the chests or underneath the bodies. So we'll see a B disc in just a little bit, um, but these songs have a very early history in elite Chinese graves. One more thing to note is that we often see some faces on these songs. So you can just see the eyes, mouth here, um, but very large, and so Again, different theories as to what this might mean. Uh, it could be connected to the divine, to the spirit realm. Uh, some people have interpreted it as a proto-dragon, this idea, again, of connecting it to power. And so obviously the dragon is a powerful figure uh, that will come to represent a connection to heaven. It will be connected to the emperor. So just kind of keeping that in mind. Uh, here is a particularly long square tube or song uh, that includes very light, very difficult to see mask, but that same kind of uh, horizontal lines that have been carved into the side of the song. And you can see that jade isn't always the bright green color, although green has a nice connection to uh, the like vegetation and plants and growth and uh, life. We also could see that with some of the browns and natural colors, but again, it's an incredibly hard stone and uh, it's something that could indicate power and wealth because it is so difficult to carve. So here's just a variety of song just to give you a sense of that variety of shapes. And here I am looking at some uh, in, at a museum in Washington, D.C. Moving on to some other possible uh, representations or creations with jade, we have a hooked cloud ornament. We tend to see these kinds of swirling elements early on in Chinese art that have uh, that are thought to represent clouds and again that idea of the dragon possibly connecting up to the heavens this interest in the heavens so this idea of clouds or proto dragon figures is something we see consistently again in these elite uh, graves uh, again connecting to the dragon this one is called a pig dragon figure so you have kind of this snout that maybe indicates a pig um, but some elements the the very large eyes the, uh, the ears here or this area here indicates more of a proto-dragon perhaps. So we definitely see these nice hints uh, going towards significant objects and symbols in Chinese art later on. Moving on to the Tautia, this uh, representation of a animal mask or this kind of elaborate mask that again has been read oftentimes as a kind of proto-dragon or possibly as a representation of the divine during this period. This idea of Shangdi, which was a heavenly deity or supreme deity at this time as we move into the Shang dynasty uh, and we'll be looking at some bronze work and burial from that period in just a second. So that's going to be dating to around 1200 BCE. But you can see just with this one you have that kind of horn or seahorn here uh, that again is similar to the kind of wispy clouds. Uh, you also have the tail and quill moving in different direction, the snout, the fangs. So pretty intimidating types of creation that we see on bronze work um, and kind of similar to those masks we saw in the song. So this is a key work that relates to the Shang dynasty, so a dynasty that was originally thought more as legendary, but uh, as archaeologists have found some impressive burials from this period, uh, we know that in fact it was not. There also are a lot of oracle bones from this period, so bones with writing on them, where individuals would have uh, asked about harvesting, about childbirth, different questions, and then these bones would have been heated and then read in terms of where the cracks were uh, to read those various messages. Um, but looking at this particular tomb, it's actually a tomb of a woman. So to have a tomb of this size for a woman is pretty impressive. She was one of the consorts of the ruler Wu Ding. So he was the 12th ruler of Shang. And Fu Hao, this particular woman, was a pretty exceptional woman. She uh, was associated with military and religious activities in China at this time. Um, her tomb you can see is a shaft tomb, which is basically an inverted pyramid. You can follow the steps down. 
It included six sacrifice dogs and 16 humans, so it was not uncommon for those in the upper classes to have individuals come with them into the afterlife. The idea that if you uh, worked with someone in life or you honored them in life, you were going to go on with them into death. Uh, also, there's a huge number of luxury items, over 400 bronzes, over a thousand jade stone and bone carvings, and over uh, 6,000 shells which could be used as currency. So this idea that life was going to carry on into this next world. This is her heavily restored tomb uh, to give you a sense of how it was laid out originally. So again, this is Lady Fu Hao, and she was just one of Wu Ding's consorts. It was not uncommon for rulers to have multiple wives or multiple consorts uh, with the idea that these rulers wanted to make a lot of alliances with different noble men. So by marrying their daughters, they were able to do that. And also, it, of course, assured that you would have a um, heir and a future heir. Uh, by having more wives. This is one of the ritual vessels found within Lady Fu Hao's tomb. This is her famous owl-shaped ritual brown, bronze wine vessel um, with elaborate decoration, things like curving snakes, um, indication of a dragon on the back here. I'll show you a drawing, different faces all around the, the vessel. Um, wine as well as meat were really some things that the upper classes would enjoy. So we th see these kinds of ritual vessels intended to hold those types of items in upper class graves during this period. Um, it also includes her name on this owl vessel, so uh, indicating that indeed this is Lady Fu Hao's vessel. Here you can just see a line drawing uh, where you get a better sense of some of that ornate decoration, additional birds on the background, those swirling snakes, other faces. Uh, so this vessel really has a number of angles in which you could look at it and enjoy it. These types of bronzes would have been cast typically in piece mold uh types piece mold techniques so this idea that you would create them in pieces and then uh, solder them together to create this complete vessel um, but so you could have these molds that could be reused and thus if you were going to create a lot of bronze works it was very efficient to do it this way um, here we're seeing another wine container this one much larger and again created out of bronze a more unusual vessel is, or more unusual creation, is this standing male figure uh, from a different area. Rather than connected to the Shang Dynasty, uh, it's from a site called Sang Xing Dui in in Western China. And so, this particular individual, or this representation, is over eight feet high. So clearly, an individual of status. Um, so this was just discovered in the 1980s. So it's a relatively recent discovery. There's a lot more research that could be done on it, um, but clearly, we're seeing a figure so like a power figure, a shaman possibly a god figure, um, but really it looks like a powerful figure who's maybe leading people in ritual or leading people in worship. Very large eyes, very abstracted types of um, features on his face, a large headdress, very slim body, um, but just the scale of this figure, over eight feet tall, you can see it being lifted uh, in the archaeological discovery in the 1980s, so very, very impressive discovery. And here are just some of the other bronze uh, objects, faces in particular, that have been discovered from San Jing Dui uh, that have really led archaeologists to wonder what is going on here. Um, because you have these massive constructions, very, very impressive works of bronze with these eyes that jut out, um, huge ears, so clearly an idea of connecting to uh, a realm beyond the human realm. We're going to move on to the time around the Zhou Dynasty and into what's called the Warring States period, um, focusing in on a very impressive bell rack from the Warring States period that does have a date on it from uh, 433 because there is an inscription about the king who gifted this bell rack to Marquis Yi. This is the individual whose tomb it comes from. So Marquis Yi has this very, very large tomb that basically looks like a palace from this particular period. So this idea of, again, of enjoying the life uh, that they lived when they were alive and continuing this into the afterlife. Um, so for example, he probably wanted to be entertained by music, so this bell rack comes with him. The bell rack was also a gift from the king, so this idea of conveying one's social status in the afterlife was very, very significant. Um, also demonstrating how wealthy he was, this type of bell rack would only have been able to be played by five to six musicians, so this idea that so many people um, would have assisted him and that he was used to having a lot of help along the way. Um, and these bells 
can play multiple tones and it's a very impressive rack from a very early period, again, 433 uh, BCE. Here's just an aerial view of Marquis Yi's tomb, around 2,500 square feet. Uh, there were, there's the bell rack, his military works. This is where his coffin was and there also were additional women who were buried here as well as additional coffins right over here. So again, individuals came with Marquis Yi into the afterlife. We also can see a bee disc here dating or created from uh, the Eastern Zhou and this dates to between the 5th and 3rd century BCE. Again, you can see those dragons along the top and that idea of the circle being connected to the heavens. You have a really nice idea of the heavens here. Um, again, these were used for burial, these bee discs, often placed on the chest or behind the body. Uh, so this idea of the dragon as something that could move between the celestial and terrestrial sphere as something that was connected to the heavens that could control uh, the weather and can control the heavenly realm, uh, something that of course you maybe would want to bring with you into the afterlife. So these bee discs, this one's particularly elegant and beautifully rendered. Uh, you can see this kind of texture along the outside and then the dragons with almost these wisps of clouds coming off along the tail and along the front of these two dragons here. All right, let's move into Korea. Um, in Korea, we see these kind of comb patterned vessels. Um, so we start to see a, a real interest in ceramics also in Korea and in Japan. Korea, however, is known for these kind of more geometric designs. You can see just kind of a slashing along the edge here, as well as more consistent triangular forms all around the base here. Uh, this dates to around 3000 BCE. The legendary founding of Korea dates to to, to 2333 uh, BCE. However, we do have vessels that date all the way back to around 7000 BCE. So there's a long period of habitation um, in the Korean peninsula. Um, however, these comb pattern vessels are particularly unique and demonstrate how food storage would have worked in the area near Seoul. Let's contrast that to the Japanese Jomon period. Um, in the Jomon period, we're just looking at a reconstruction of a Jomon house, a Shiba Inu, the kind of dog that uh, Jomon people probably would have hunted with in order to, or the, a similar type of dog uh, that they would have hunted with in order to uh, kill animals and uh, to get food. So Jomon pottery, Jomon means cord marked, and so we have some beautiful pottery from this period that has this kind of cord marking or beautiful coil designs. So the early Jomon period here, you can see a kind of design using those thin coils uh, to create a lovely pattern on the exterior. Again, this could have been used for storage. Most likely in the Jomon period, it was kind of semi-nomadic, so people would leave these villages for a certain amount of time to go hunt and then return back to these settlements. So of course, food storage would have been very important. Here we're seeing this idea of cord pattern from the middle Jomon period, this idea of paddling the surface uh, before the clay is dry with a rope bound stick, um, and also this idea of the coiling technique in order to create the vessel. One of my favorite Jomon uh, pottery vessels is this middle Jomon work that almost looks like flames emerging out from the top. So you have this really nice texture along this top edge. Uh, you can see it's very irregular along this and you have even more elaborate coil designs along the base. Here's just another view where you really get that sense of that those kind of fiery flames emerging out from the top and a really kind of sculptural quality along the exterior. So these Jomon vessels really are like individual works of sculpture, but of course they also had the more practical um, association of being used for food storage. Also from the Jomon period, we have uh, these dogu figurines or clay figurines that really are a mystery. Um, some people have identified them as more fertility figures because there are slight indications of breasts, also those wide hips, so somewhat similar to the mother goddess figures we saw in the Indus Valley culture. Um, but there's also indications of possible body scarification, these patterns we see here. Uh, also the idea of elaborate dress or um, kind of patternings that people could have worn. Obviously it's very cold in some areas of Japan, so some people have even theorized these are like the goggles that were worn to protect one's eyes in the snow, um, leather goggles that had a slit in them. Um, there's also of course the possible reading of a shaman or more of a spiritual figure um, if it is to be gendered male, however those slight indications of breast seem to give it more of a female reading, so possibly a female shaman uh, if it is supposed to be some type of religious figure. 
All right, our final culture is just to think about the yayoi period, a rather late period in Japan, considering the dates we've been looking at in this particular lecture. But we start to see more social stratification, a change in the population. Um, this is where you start to see more of these kingdoms develop. Um, there is an architecture that indicates a need for defense, so more walls. Also, the rice agriculture develops, so this idea of who controls the rice most likely has the power. Um, and also, bronze casting is developed around this time. So yayoi pottery looks like this. It tends to be more pointed in the base, more minimalistic or simplistic in design when contrasted to the jomon pottery. Some of it has more of a red design or red color. Um, however, some of it is more white, um, but clearly a shift from the jomon tradition showing a new period in Japanese culture. We also see these dotaku bells, um, these ceremonial bells from the yayoi period, and these bells are very different from Marquis Yi's types of bells, which were meant to be played by many individuals. These make a sound when you do hit them, um, however, it is very kind of muffled, and these have been found actually buried and with other ceremonial objects like mirrors. And so what we think is that these might have often been buried on hillsides overlooking rice fields in order to ensure that a plentiful crop would have been um, provided for. So these dotaku bells could have been significant in that sense. Uh, we also see different animals represented. For example, deer are pretty significant uh, because this idea of antlers and this idea of regrowth. Um, also, the antler sometimes was connected to the idea of a tree of a life. So again, kind of life and regrowth, very significant. Um, also, other auspicious animals were sometimes represented. Hunting scenes could be represented on these dotaku bells. And so they, again, probably have a kind of ceremonial purpose in order to bring about a good crop uh, or to bring about good luck in some way. However, not a traditional kind of musical instrument. And then a final kind of fun activity is just to try to identify which culture these vessels came from. So give it a second, maybe pause the video. Okay, I'll tell you which is which. Um, so A would be Korea, more of that comb style pottery. This is Banpo style from China. This is Joman from Japan, also Joman. And then this is Yayoi from Japan. So I hope you got 100%. See you in the next video.